Then uh, we're going to talk today about the recursion theorem. So, and what the recursion theorem says is um, for every computable f, for every computable function, there exists a natural number such that um, n is equal to f of n. Now, now you can tell there's something funny about this equation. This would of course be a very nice theorem, but, but also it's plainly false. Yeah. Successor function is mostly computable, uh, but 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 it is the, 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 this is kind of the idea we are after. We're looking for a fixed point theorem. And so so this we can't have, but what we can have is this: that uh, if you're thinking not about just the natural numbers, but uh, natural numbers be rep being representatives of Turing machine programs, then you can get a a fixed point in this sense. Right? It's clearly not a fixed point for the function f because, as the successor function shows, you can't have that. But it is a fixed point in that n and f of n represent the same partial computable function. statement and uh, I'm giving you a little bit of time to, to read it and to uh, think about it. Probably one of the thoughts you might have is, uh, yeah, so on. Uh, but it turns out to be uh, very nice. Useful. So, so we'll first do a couple of applications, and from these applications, get a little bit of the the, uh, the, the flavor what's going on, and, and then we'll we'll finish with the proof uh, of this theorem. I'm terrible at estimating time, but I, I hope to be able to do these applications and then the finish of the proof and still finish early so that I can still get a cup of coffee before I go to the seminar. <laughs> uh, and moreover. This is the kind of theorem that you just need to spend some time with and get used to, so, so I don't want to throw too much material at you anyway around this theorem. You should be spending a lot of time on it, and it reminds me that you design homework. Uh, somebody here, I won't mention names, was going to send me an email to remind me of this. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and I, I thought about designing homework on several occasions, uh, not ever when I was both near my computer and near a copy of the book, but, but I do want to uh, give some homework, right? I'm not going to collect it, but I do want to talk about it. And so uh, if somebody sends me an email this afternoon, anybody of you do this, send me an email, remind me, and then I'll likely read it when I'm at my computer with a book, assign some exercises, and then we'll spend like Friday, all of Friday, discussing these exercises to, to really... Uh, I had the same process with the email. I only thought about sending it. <laughs> That's how these things go. But, but, but I, I, I like to delegate. So, so one of you, or, or I guess all of you, are now responsible if you don't remind me this time. Uh, I think Friday is a good time to talk about these things. Okay, recursion theorem. So, first uh, application. Um, for 
every computable f um, there exists an n such that uh, wn is equal to w f of n. And, and, and if, you, if you actually know your definitions, which you should, then you look at it for a second and you say, well, that's, that's not even an application. Uh, right? Because this is, this is just reading the recursion theorem in the computably enumerable set context. Wn is the domain of phi of n, w f of n is the domain of f of n. All of these functions are the same, then they have the same domains. Uh, more interesting is this one. There exists an M such that W of M is equal to singleton N. Uh, and this, in some sense, is uh, a nice simple example of a, a prototypical application of uh, the recursion theorem. Right? Because the, the right hand side is something which is easy to define if you knew what n was. Right? If you know what n is, then, then the machine that has this uh, as like w, uh, how, do I, how do I write this? Well, let me write it the right way. Right? Uh, w of f of n equal to n, right? Uh, the function f is a particularly nice and simple computable function. It is the function that, given input n, gives you a Turing machine that only holds on input n. Well, this is very easy. You, 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 on, on any input, you check in your Turing machine whether this input is equal to n. If, and you do this by just counting, are there, right, a unary? Are there n ones on the tape, which is very easy to do in a Turing machine? Are there n ones on the tape? If you find that the answer is yes, then you're done. If you find that the answer is no, either that there's too few or too many ones on the tape, you go into some infinite loop and you never converge. So, so this function f is very easy. Uh, and as soon as you have this function f, then it's very easy to find the n, because now the recursion theorem says, well, f of n is this particularly easy computable function. It has a fixed point like this in the recursion theorem. Therefore, this phi of n now uh, is exactly uh, a thing which converts on itself. But, but if you only look at the, the result of this thing, then you see the, the typical application or the typical idea of how you apply a recursion theorem, uh, and that is that you say, well, uh, I, I'm going to define an index n while I pretend I already know what n is. Right? That's what you're looking here. On all, if you just look at this, this first equation, not the one I wrote down, then it seems like you are defining a Turing machine n using its own index. And, and that's exactly what the recursion theorem allows you to do. And, and so in this case, of course, we didn't do much with n, but, but in general, you can write down whatever computable expression you want with n and, and get an index that does this. Uh, and that turns out to be um, uh, pretty useful and, uh, and, uh, and powerful, moreover. Third consequence. Uh, the, the, the third consequence. I'll, I'll give a little bit of introduction to, to what, it is, what it's about, and, and really, I will talk a lot more about that uh, in uh, in I think the next lecture, or, or depending how quick I go at the end of this lecture. Um, and that is the the idea of indices for sets. Right? We have. Uh, a bunch of different types of sets, computable sets, computably enumerable sets. Uh, you can 
throw into the mix, in this case, finite sets uh, and things like that. And, and for each of these sets, we have different descriptions, right? Particularly the computable enumerable set. We, we, we worked on this quite a bit last lecture, and, and we saw that there is a bunch of different descriptions. Uh, and now these different descriptions, um, we noticed in some cases that going from one type of description to another type of description was really nice and easy. In particular, a, an effective transformation of some sense or another. Uh, and and uh, in other cases, it is very hard to go from one description to another, even though you can prove that for everything that has a description like this, it also has a description like that. Uh, and so that's what this uh, next consequence is about. There does not exist a partial computable psi such that for every x, if w of x Is computable, right? This this can happen every now and then. W of x. Whenever you write W of x, you know this is a computably enumerable set. It's the domain of the x Turing machine. But uh, in particular, we showed that every computable set is computably enumerable. Therefore, every computable set also has descriptions like this. Uh, and so what happens is, if you have an x that says W of x is computable, you have a description of x but not the best description it has. Uh, and what would be really nice is if from this not so good description you could in a really nice way obtain a better description. Which is to say, it would be really nice uh, if there existed this function psi, which I'm now going to describe, such that uh, whenever w of x is computable, psi of x converges uh, to some value y uh, and uh, that, that, doesn't, that looks like a typo. Clearly what it's supposed to mean is uh, phi of y is the characteristic function w of y. Right? The, this y is the good type of index for a computable set. It is the type of index which is, is the Turing machine that says yes or no to any membership function. Uh, the x is a bad index, it only converges when uh, you enter. So this would be a particularly nice uh, function psi. <laughs> which allows us to improve from a, a so-called uh, sigma zero one index to, to a, uh, what do you call it, a delta not index, I think. I could probably look it up over here. Yes. So this is what you call a sigma zero one index for a set. This is a delta not index. And this, this statement, if it were true, would give you a way of going from sigma zero one indices to Delta not indices, which would be nice. Everybody see why this would be nice? But why is clearly a better description of this set than X is? Even though if you don't care, if you didn't care about effectiveness, then they're all the same, right? They completely describe what's in the set and what's not. But here you can compute your answers. From Y you can compute your answers. From X, you can only compute positive answers. Okay. Let's prove it then. So I have 
have to show that that there does not exist such a partial computable function psi. So of course I start with the assumption: suppose there does exist such a computable function psi. Uh, what happens? And, and in exactly the same case as, as the other theorem like this we showed, uh, we take the computable function psi and we build another function from it. Uh, and, and so we define the function f by oh, well, it's have this property f of n should be the index for a Turing machine which gives the following uh, set um, uh, it gives zero exactly if psi of n converges and phi of psi of n of zero converges and is equal to zero, uh, empty set otherwise. So the first question, of course, you should now wonder is, uh, did what I write here, does what I wrote here make sense? Can I do that? Uh, and of course, uh, I say define f like this. Well, uh, of course there is an f like this, but I want f to be computable, of course. also the, the, the layer of the definition of W f of n. Really what I'm defining is just the index of a Turing machine. So in thinking about it, you want to think, what is the behavior of phi of f of n that I'm looking for? Well, phi of f of n uh, looks at its input and um, whenever the input is not zero, it immediately diverges. Right? The, these sets here on the right hand side never contain anything other than zero. So if it sees an input which is non zero, it can immediately diverge. Uh, if it does see zero, then it, it needs to decide uh, am I going to converge or not? Uh, and what does it do? Well, it starts computing psi of n. Now, it might of course be that psi of n does not converge, in which case, this case is false. But in which case you already have the appropriate behavior for the other case, which is not converging. So, so then you say, okay, if this doesn't converge, I'm already doing the right thing. So suppose it does converge, then I start looking at this thing. Uh, again, if it doesn't converge, then I'm working on this computation. It doesn't converge, so I'm not in this case, therefore I'm in the other case, and I'm already, uh, I'm already exhibiting the right behavior. So, having to do that. If it does converge, then I can look at what the output is of this thing. Uh, and this output, well, I can check, if, is it zero or not? If it is zero, then I converge, and I have exactly the right behavior for this. If it's not zero, that, that now, finally, I have to purposefully diverge to have the right behavior for this. But uh, to me, that reading of the definition convinces me that I have, I have a good definition of this function f of n, uh, and, uh, uh, and I can compute it. Did you use the recursion theorem just now in the same sense as down here? No. The no, I didn't. Like, no. Uh, why do you think I did? Uh, I can, of course, now, as soon as I have this, I can apply the recursion theorem to f. But in order to get f, I don't need it. But what f does uh, just depends on n. But n, f gets to use n because it's its input. OK. But here there was trickery for being able to use n because n is, is well, if you're trying to describe the Turing machine, then the Turing machine is described in terms of its own index, yeah. which yeah, is kind of tricky. But, 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 but here, 
the Turing machine is described using n, but n is just the inputters. There's nothing funky going on. I, I, in my mind, the only thing that, that I, I've tried to explain, uh, I've, I've done this before, but the only thing I've explained is, okay, we have your case distinction. And, 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 and uh, this case distinction is exactly formulated in the right way that you can do it. If I had written down any other choice than, than just empty set over here, I'd be in trouble. Ah, that's not entirely true. If, if I had written anything else, uh, I'd, I, I, I want to define this to be one or the other of the two sets. Uh, this set, however I describe it, cannot contain zero, because then I, I can't do the case distinction. It could, of course, here be easily equal to singleton 2, because, right, like I said, I, I started the description with check if your input is zero. If it's not zero, then you just diverge. Well, you can say check if your input is zero. If it's not zero, check if your input is two. Converge if it does, diverge if it doesn't. Uh, and then you could have another set here. But, now, now I'm more confusing the issue than clarifying it, I suspect. The, the whole point is that at zero something interesting happens, and, and by reading it the way I just did, it shows that, that this F is a nice computable function and gives rise to this. Uh, it shows it to me. Everybody happy with it? So I have a computable F. And 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 I'm talking about the recursion theorem. Uh, it's <coughs> it, it's hard now not to say by the recursion theorem uh, we know that there exists an n such that w n is equal to w f of n. Right. So so all this now says is that there exists a computably enumerable set with the sigma zero one index n such that its behavior, its behavior depends on what Psi does on M. This is exactly what you want. You're trying, to get, you're trying to get this function Psi. We want to show it doesn't exist, so it has to misbehave somewhere. Uh, how do we get it to misbehave somewhere? It's kind of hard, but as soon as you start defining uh, 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 a set WN in terms of its, of its own index and what happens, what Psi does on that index, then uh, you're doing pretty well. Uh, also, no, notice cl that clearly uh, WF of n, whichever case you're in, it's a computable set because it's a finite set, right? It's either the empty set or a singleton. In either case, it is computable. Even though F of n clearly is one of these not very good index indices necessarily because there, there's like a, a, a two halting questions in between the yes or no answer for zero. There's two times you have to wonder if something holds. So, so it's, this is a good example why a sigma zero one index a priori is pretty bad. It's, it's, it's difficult computations going on for something which only in zero you need to remember a yes or no answer. Um, okay. So now we should have a contradiction, and the contradiction is, is, is pretty, I'll write it out more carefully because I, I wrote it on my piece of paper more carefully anyway. But, but it's pretty clearly what happens. Uh, this psi of n is supposed to be a delta not index, right? It's an index of the characteristic function of this set here. Uh, but exactly when it converges and says zero is not in the set, we put zero in the set. In every other case, when it doesn't converge, or it converges and gives output 1, or it gives output 481, what do I care? In every other case, when, when maybe this would say it's in there, we, we make sure it's not in there, but as soon as we can verify that the result of psi of n says 0 is not in there, that's exactly the one time that we stick 0 in our set, and, and that's the, the way we come up with this definition of work. So it's, so more, more in detail, we say phi of um, uh, psi of n of 0 is equal to 1. So, so, so we're still working, I guess I didn't write down. The assumption was 
such a psi like this exists. Uh, so suppose we have this set, this Wn, what happens with psi of n? We know it's an index for a computable set, because both of these cases are computable. Uh, what happens? Well, psi of n of 0, suppose it's equal to 1. Um, this happens if and only if 0 is Wn, right? Uh, psi of n is supposed to be an index for the characteristic function of Wn, uh, and, and this is part of the definition of the characteristic function. But, but, but when is 0 in Wn? Well, 0 is in Wn exactly if you're in this, this first case here. That happens. Uh, if and only if psi of n converges and phi of psi of n of 0 converges to 0. So, so now you almost have a contradiction. Right? A, a, a nice contradiction is of the form x is equal to 0 if and only if x is equal to 1. Right? So, so you almost have this, this thing is equal to 1, if and only if that thing is equal to 0. Well, there, there's just one more thing in here. Uh, one more thing is, is the convergence of psi of n. So, so you could have uh, some hope that we didn't disprove the existence of psi f, because there's this extra condition in here. But we know this always happens. Because by assumption, we had a function psi such that whenever its index is the index of a computable function, it converges and computes uh, a delta naught index for the set. So this is true because we might not know which case we're in, but it's certainly a computable set, therefore psi of n always converges. So this is not really a conjunction of two things you have to worry about if true. One of them is automatically true. And so you get this thing is equal to 1, if and only if it's equal to 0, uh, contradiction. The, the, the last subscript of the subscript on the previous thing, you, you sure that should be with y? Is it? No, that should be an x, of course. Oh, okay. I, I never pointed at this arrow yet, but, but, but if you are the computable characteristic function, well, a characteristic function is in particular a total function, so you don't have to worry about this convergence here. we just showed it doesn't look maybe that interesting yet but, but uh, it is something which when you're doing a proof of showing that something is computable or that a certain construction works uh, sometimes you could make the construction work if you had such a, such a y but you only have an x now, that's okay, because you know that if you're computable, there exists a y, so you can just change the input of your construction. But, but sometimes it doesn't work, because you have to do this for all wx, which are computable, and, and then in your construction, you would need such a psi to get your y's. And, and so then, uh, you just failed. I need a different idea. Here's a nice application of it, which is non-existence of the partial computable function. Here is the most simple example of, of, sort of the general idea. You get to define a function using its own index in the definition. Uh, and, and so we're ready to uh, prove this thing. Okay, 
Okay, so, so what we need is for every computable function we can find this fixed point. I'll keep calling it a fixed point even though it's clearly not a, in general a fixed point of the function f, but it's, it's uh, uh, good enough. So first step, define a function f. I, 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 and, and this function f is kind of um, where, where the diagonalization happens, which is also why I don't call it f, of course, I call it d. Uh, this function is defined by phi of d of u on an input z is equal to phi of phi of n on n in z if phi of n of n converges and it diverges otherwise. And so you look at this uh, and your immediate reaction now hopefully is that, that, that I got my, my case distinction exactly right again. Right? The first case says, check if this converges, if it does, do something else. If your case is, check if this converges, then the other case should always be diverged. Because otherwise you need to solve the halting problem. Okay. So, so uh, my case distinction is exactly right. Uh, and then you look at this and you say, well, then, um, uh, then I think it looks pretty clearly that d is a computable function, right? Because what does d of u, so u is your input, u, yeah. <laughs> there's n's everywhere, and there's one u, this is almost certainly in n, and, and, and it makes a lot more sense, right? Because what else is n? So d on n, what does d of n do? Well, first it starts computing phi of n on input n. Well, why can you do this? Well, first of all, because you can easily imagine doing that. But, but you can also think of it much easier. You have a universal Turing machine lying around. Uh, and you can take this universal Turing machine and start running it on, on input n n. Uh, and then you exactly compute this. Uh, if you diverge, you're all good. If you converge, you just computed a number. What is this number? Well, this number can be looked at of, as the index of a Turing machine. Again, given the universal Turing machine, with this number as its first input and z as its second input, start computing and, and you compute exactly what's in this expression. And, and, and so, right? Two times set up the input right and start the universal Turing machine running uh, is, is, is a, a simple thing to do and, and it's all clearly computable. So, so I didn't just define the function d and figure out that the definition is good. Uh, I, I showed that d is a computable function. Uh, and, and also, of course, uh, depending on exactly how you formulate it, right? Maybe you get the function d, d from the S and N theorem, because it looks a little bit like that, right? It's, it's d of something n, and uh, on the right-hand side, I treat n as, a, as an extra input, so it looks like the S and N theorem. Uh, otherwise, you use the same trick we used for the S and N theorem uh, to show that d can be chosen to be injective. Uh, either way, I hope we now all agree that D is computable one-to-one. Uh, one. Oh, there's more to it. It's also total because the description was really easy. On input N, you just compute the following Turing machine. That this Turing machine that you computed in many cases won't hold is not a problem. Uh, the, the finding which Turing machine it is is the thing which always succeeds and, and makes this a total function. Uh, also, independent of the function f, 
right? f is the computable function we're trying to find a fixed point of. Uh, this part of the proof does not depend on f, which is kind of nice because it means that, that for every f you use the same d. Everybody happy so far? But what if you had like an n and m that were different? And, and I, I have only m's on the board. I know, but I'm, I'm just, the one to one is, is bothering me. What, yeah. if had, what if you had an n and m that were different such that phi sub n of n was the same as phi sub m of m? Well, one of the two is bigger. So you're taking the first time that you get that. So, 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 so what I would do, there, there, there's, there's, there's two ways. I could just say, well, it's the parameter theorem. Go back, figure it out. But, but, but the better response now is, so, okay, I, I compute d of m in this way, not worrying about the one-to-oneness. But it is, so it's a total computable function at this point, right? Yeah. So I have a total computable function, and on every input it computes the index of a Turing machine. And now I want to make it one-to-one. -one. So how do, my, how do I make it one-to-one? -one? Well, I, I now from this function d, I define a function d prime, and d prime is defined by recursion. Suppose I'm trying to find d prime of m, and I already have d prime of all the smaller ones. Yeah. So I compute d prime of all the smaller ones, I add it all, all together, I get a big number, which is bigger or equal to all these earlier outputs. Now I compute d of m, I get a Turing machine, and this Turing machine I pad with enough nonsense instruction given by the sum of the earlier instructions. And so I, I get a Turing machine which is, uh, has a code which is clearly a lot bigger than the codes of the earlier ones. And th this is one of these examples, to, or one of these reasons why I like it much better to know how to make something one-to-one -one than to remember that the parameter theorem gives you some function which is one-to-one -one because Well, my brain is organized in such a way that I can remember this and I can't remember which theorem gives you one-to-one -one and which doesn't. But even though, I, of course, now the parameter theorem gives you one-to-one. -one. Computable, one-to-one, -one, total, independent of f. Everybody on the Why same page. Total? Okay. Why is it total? Yeah. Because d on input n just combines together uh, the, the following instructions. On input n, double the input on the tape, start running the Turing machine. If, you, if whenever you might ever get an output, uh, take that as the first input, use z as the second input, and start the universal Turing machine running again. And, and so whenever I say start the universal Turing machine running again, of course I'm starting something, I don't know whether it will hold. But, but this sequence of instructions is something which is very easy to obtain. And, and that's all d of n is. d of n is the index of a Turing machine. So d of n is the code of the set of instructions which says put n twice on there, start running the universal Turing machine, take the output you get, put z next to it, start running the universal Turing machine. This, obtaining this set of instructions is really easy, even though running it, it might never hold. But that's what D does, it obtains a set of instructions. Right? And, and, and at this point, I'm, I'm beginning to suspect I maybe better have said this explicitly in terms of the parameter theorem, but, but that's just not the way I think of this kind of thing. Right? Yes, it is a general theorem that gives this result, but, but uh, uh, my brain doesn't work that way. Fortunately, the, the, the proof is not very long anymore, even though uh, as soon as we finish it up, uh, you're not necessarily going to feel very enlightened. This is one of those theorems where uh, the proof, I think, is convincing, uh, but, but there's, there's something a little funny about it. And, 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 and Bob agrees, and that's why he has this spiel in the book about how to think about it in a more intuitive way. Which works pretty well, but I, I'm not going to repeat it. Anyway, now, to find an index v such that phi of v is equal to 
F composed with D. Right? D is a computable function, F is a computable function, therefore the composition of the two is a computable function, therefore it has some index V. Now, now it's a little bit more than that, of course. Given an index for F, you can from it, in a very simple, effective way, find an index V that does this. Because it's just a matter of, of taking two Turing machines, or two codes for Turing machines, and, and, and concatenating them together. Well, you need to be a little bit careful, right, when you concatenate Turing machines, because they, they might use the same states for very different purposes. So if you, if you try to combine two Turing machines into the composition Turing machine, uh, as a first step, you would, should make the, their, their sets of states completely disjoint, then stick them together, then add one or two instructions that show how to go from the one Turing machine to the other. Anyway, so such an index V is, is easy to find and even easier to see it exists. Let uh, let n be equal to V of V. Right? I, I, I found this V and now I just take this V, I input it into the computable function D and I check its output. Um, now we're done. This is the fixed point. Uh, I, I haven't shown you yet that it is the fixed point. It's, it's one sequence of equations. But, but, but nice to obtain, uh, nice to observe now is that uh, we found this n in a computable way. Right? D is always the same computation, it's a total function. It has a certain in index, pick this index. And then here I observed that finding this V was very nice and effective. And then if you have found something in an effective way and you can put a computable function on it, then this N is also effectively found. So it's not just that you have, that that, that exists in a, in a uh, result of the axiom of choice kind of form. There exists something which you can never get your hands on. Uh, there exists something, and, and, and if you had to find it, you could easily find it with a program too. Okay, so so let's see that it works. Phi of n is equal to phi of d of v, because that's how n was defined. Uh, d of v, well, d of v, d was defined just up here. This gives us a, a, a given function. So this is really phi of phi of v v. Uh, right? Uh, this is the definition over here. Uh, and, and, and so we use it like that. Uh, this, however, uh, this V was a very carefully chosen index for, for a, a, a function. And so this function, now I look here in the, in, the, in the index and it says compute y of v. Well, y of v was the index for f composed with d. So this is exactly equal to phi of f of d of v. Uh, and d of v was n, so this is phi of f of n. So phi of n is equal to phi of f of the n uh, and that gives us uh, the end of the proof.